I am an, uh, the co-chair of the Anti-Militarism Committee for Brooklyn for Peace. And we spend our time trying to prevent young people from going into the military. Uh, and so it is a particularly, uh, it is therefore particularly appropriate, I think, that I introduce our next speaker. Uh, Paul Chappelle comes from a military family. Uh, he's a graduate of West Point, served eight years in the military, um, and including a tour in Iraq. He is currently the Peace Leadership Director of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. And Paul comes here to challenge us. Um, he comes here as a warrior for peace. He's explicit about that, that he is, uh, he takes a soldier's epic, um, the four principal mission parts of which are as follows, and I think that we as peace activists need, need to think about and engage with this ethic and what Paul has to say uh, about uh, being a warrior for peace. First, he's, the, the first part of it is that the mission comes first. A selfless point. All of these are selfless points. Uh, as peace activists, we too believe that one can never accept defeat as the permanent result. We never quit, obviously, because you're here today. You know you never quit, because you should be outside, right? Okay. And we never leave a fallen comrade. Those are the four elements that Paul describes as the warrior's ethic, the soldier's ethic. Uh, we have a lot to learn from this. Um, let me raise two very different parts and points um, that Paul has engaged with. One is, what is it that we see is the future for the military? I mean, let's you engage that thought experiment. We are now king. And it's always good to be king, but what are we going to do with the military if and when we become king? What is it we're supposed to do with them? Let me raise another point that Paul brings up that I think we need to think about, which is, is we're dealing with the question of the military versus contractors. Paul points out that it's one of the great achievements of American democracy that you, we have a military that for 200 years has unquestioningly accepted the proposition that civilians make the decisions. So when somebody like General MacArthur says, oh no, let's have a war with China, President Truman says, thank you for your service, it's been wonderful, but we'll see you later. No matter how much and how popular, General MacArthur was, and that old soldier, in fact, faded away. It's really important for us, I think, to think about this, particularly with regard to the issue of contractors, because civilian control of corporations and contractors has not been nearly as successful in our 200 years in the military. I point these two very different points out because I think we've got a lot to learn from Paul. Uh, I hope you will give him a warm welcome and Let's listen to what he's got to say. Have any of you read a book called On Killing, written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman? A book called On Killing. It's a book all about killing. And it's one of the most uplifting books you will ever read because it shows that killing is a learned behavior. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman was a West Point psychology professor and army ranger. And he wrote a book called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill and War in Society, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. On Killing is required reading in classes at West Point. It's required reading at the FBI Academy. It's on the Marine Corps Commandant's required reading list. And it's also required reading in peace studies programs at Berkeley and in Quaker and Mennonite colleges. And the premise of his book, the premise of his book is that it is not natural for human beings to kill other human beings. And he bases this off military history. He says, it is unnatural for human beings to kill other human beings. And we actually have a natural resistance to killing other human beings. And he says, other animals also have a natural resistance to killing their own species. He says, for example, rattlesnake. Rattlesnake will bite every other animal with its lethal fangs, but when rattlesnakes fight each other, what do they do? They wrestle. If you look at king cobra, king cobra not only bite every other animal, they actually eat other snakes. But when king cobras fight each other, they wrestle. If you look at buffalo, bulls, deer, any animal with horns, when they fight other animals, they always try to attack the animal from the flank, from the side, to gut the animal. But when they fight, head to, when they fight each other, they always fight head-to-head, -head, the least lethal form of combat. So if you look at an African buffalo, when it fights a lion, it'll try to hit the lion in the ribs and kill it. 
But when African buffalo fight each other, they always fight head to head, the least lethal form of combat. A lot of predators, hyena, leopards, lions, when they fight other species, they go for strangulation bites. When they fight their own species, they tend not to go for strangulation bites. Now, not all animals have this aversion, and animals do die from fighting each other. But if they fought each other the way they fought other species, the casualty rate would be much, much higher. Now, why do animals have that aversion? Why would an African buffalo fight a lion? Why did it try to hit it from the side? And why, when it fights another African buffalo, why does it fight head to head? What's the reason for that? It's their own tribe. Right. It's preservation of the species. Preservation of the species. African buffalo spend most of their time around what animal? African buffalo, right? If they fought each other the way they fought lion, they'd all go extinct. They could not keep up that kind of action against their own species without going extinct if they fought each other the way they fought lion. And human beings spend most of their time around what animal? Human beings, right? So doesn't it make sense that we might have a natural aversion to killing other human beings? Doesn't it make sense we might have this natural aversion? But what evidence do we have? The evidence that we have is all the military history. All the military history supports this. So when on killing, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman says that there has never been a single war in human history, not one war, that has not had the dehumanization. Every single war requires dehumanization for it to happen. And this is done through what he calls distance. And he talks about three kinds of distance. The first form of distance is psychological distance. Psychological distance means portraying people as subhuman. And this is often done through derogatory name calling. And in On Killing, he talks about how our own country has used derogatory name calling in war to portray people as subhuman. So what do we call the Germans when we fought them? Huns, right? Krauts? What do we call the Japanese when we fought them? Japs, Nips, right? Keep in mind there's multiple racial slurs for every ethnic group. There's multiple racial slurs for every ethnic group. I'm half Korean, a quarter white, and a quarter black, and I grew up in Alabama, so I've heard a lot of them. And what do we call the people we're fighting in Vietnam? Ragnets. Gooks, right? And what do we call the people we're fighting now in the Middle East? What do you always hear in the media? Ragnets. You don't really hear Raghead in the media. You don't hear Haji in the media. It's much more subtle than that. Terrorist, right? Terrorist is the word. Far more subtle. The dehumanization now is far more sophisticated now than it was 50 years ago. Far more subtle. When you hear the word terrorist, do any of you think of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Christian? Oh. Yes. No. Yes. Is that the first thing that pops into your mind? I mean, when, when, you hear, when you hear the word terrorist, do you immediately think of a white Christian? Do you think of Timothy McVeigh? Yes. Do you think of all the terrorism that happened in Ireland, right? Or the guy in Norway? The guy in Norway who killed all those people, the American media called him a gunman. Or look at the Unabomber, he was a terrorist. But the guy in Norway, they called him a gunman. But if a Muslim kills a bunch of people, he's a terrorist. If a Muslim is in his own country fighting the U.S., he's a terrorist. He's in his own country, he's a terrorist. So the word does have a racial connotation in terms of how it's used. The guy who shot the congresswoman and all those people, the media didn't call him a terrorist, but if a Muslim would have shot a congresswoman and a whole bunch of people, they would have called him a terrorist, right? And this goes way back. And this goes way back. What did the ancient Greeks call all non-Greeks? Barbarians. Barbarians. Any of you know where the word barbarian came from? It was the language. The original connotation of it, it was a way of making fun of how people talked. The Greeks believed that if you weren't speaking Greek, then when you talked, it sounded like you were saying bar, 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 bar. So they call those people barbarians. So making fun of how people talk and they're saying that they're making animal noises is a subtle way to dehumanize them. If any of you read Aristotle, and he was a blatant racist, he believed the Greeks were the master race, and he wrote about how the barbarians are not like us. Our natural state is Greeks, is democracy. Their natural state is despotism. They're not like Greek people. Which was contrary to Socrates, before him and Alexander the Great after him. But he really dehumanized the... Yes. The Greeks called the Macedonians barbarians. Now the Greeks are calling the Macedonians Greeks. Right. It's very subjective. And this is very subtle too, right? Any of you hear the word illegal alien? It sounds like a convict from Mars, right? <laughs> or now they just call them illegals. But it's very subtle. And it can be also very overt. Any of you seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? What do they call the people being massacred? 
cockroaches. They call them cockroaches. Any of you read the Rolling Stone article that just came out about drone attacks? Yeah. So a Rolling Stone article came out about, I think, two weeks ago about the whole drone attacks. And they said that the term that is used when a drone kills a, um, any target, they call it a buck splat. So this whole thing is very subtle and it can be very overt. Second form of distance is moral distance. Moral distance means I'm good, you're evil, and God is on my side. And that is why civil wars are so bloody. Because during a civil war, you look like the people you're fighting, you have the same language, customs, and traditions as them, so moral distance is used to make people believe that if you kill the enemy, you're expelling evil from the world. So psychological distance, you're, you're killing subhumans, right? You're, you're killing cockroaches. But moral distance, you're killing bad guys, you're killing terrorists, you're killing evildoers, you're killing monsters. And what you see now is you see moral distance being used. If you look at World War II, we blatantly dehumanized the German and Japanese populations. We had open war against their civilian populations. If you look at the propaganda posters back then, and if you look at the Iraq War, and you listen to President Bush, he said, look, the Iraqi people are just like us. They want democracy. They want freedom. Their women want education. Their women want to vote. And we have a moral obligation to liberate these poor, suffering people from this tyrannical dictatorship. Or look at Afghanistan. Look at these poor, suffering women. They want education. They want to go to school. They're just like our women. And you have the evil Taliban oppressing these poor people. Don't we have a moral obligation to liberate these poor, suffering people from oppression and tyranny? So it's getting harder now to dehumanize people. And as a result, the propaganda has become far more sophisticated. And a lot more of it now is moral versus psychological, or psychological distance. The third form is mechanical distance. Mechanical distance means that it's easier to drop a bomb on someone at 10,000 feet than it is to shoot them with a rifle at 300 yards. It's easier to shoot somebody with a rifle at 300 yards than it is to stab them with a knife at close range. So the farther away you are from someone, the easier it is to kill them. Makes sense, right? It's, e it's easier to kill people if they look like ants at 10,000 feet than if they look like your family or your children or your brothers or sisters. So here's a question. Why did the Nazis use a gas chamber? Why do you think the Nazis used a gas chamber? More efficient not to use all that ammunition that they need in the battlefield. Good answer. They weren't face-to-face. -face. Right. It's actually a myth that it was efficient. Because there's nothing more efficient than the firing squad. The firing squads were far more efficient than the gas chamber. There's nothing more efficient than lining people up, making them dig a ditch to become their grave, making them stand in their grave, shooting them with inexpensive bullets and throwing dirt on top of them. The Nazis killed nearly a million people with firing squads, but they switched to the gas chamber because so many Nazi soldiers were becoming traumatized from killing women and children. Didn't have to see them die. It allows a few people to do the majority of the killing without having to see the victims actually die. So the Nazi soldiers, many of them had mothers. Uh, all of them had mothers. Many of them had sisters. Some of them had daughters, right? And imagine 10 hours a day killing women and children. A lot of people can't handle the psychological stress. And the justification was actually protecting the executioner. If you, you can read the justification coming from Adolf Eichmann, who did a lot of the logistics, from Heinrich Himmler, who was in charge of the SS, and the comment of Auschwitz. They were saying, we have to protect the executioner from the process of execution. So when people are being executed, whether it's firing squad or hanging or electric chair, why are their faces almost always covered? Why is that? So that the people watching the execution don't become traumatized. And you have that 2% who can do it, right? And you have people who can do it, who can't do it, but then they learn how to do it and they become very psychotic. And now as a concern was too many of the people engaging in it were having all sorts of breakdowns. So it's all about protecting, protecting the executioner. When gangsters execute people, when gangsters execute people, where they almost always shoot them? Back of the head. Gangsters, hardened criminals, shoot people in the back of the head because they don't want to see someone's face when they die. Now, in addition to the mechanical distance of the gas chamber, the Nazis also used moral distance by calling people evil. The Nazis also used psychological distance by calling people subhuman. If the Nazis would have said all human beings are people like us, do you think the Holocaust would have ever happened? Of course not. A massacre as big as the Holocaust requires all three forms of dehumanization. Psychological, moral, mechanical distance. 
But think about that. If human beings are naturally violent, why would every country in history, without a single exception, have to dehumanize the enemy in order to wage war? Why would every country in history, without one exception, have to create distance in order to wage war? And why would it be so hard or her to kill somebody if you see that person as a human being? If you look at somebody and think, that person's like me, it's very hard or her to kill them. If you look at somebody and think, that person has hopes and fears and dreams like I do, that person has a family like I do, that person feels joy and pain like I do, it's very hard or her to kill them. So I think the idea that we're not naturally violent, which all military history supports, is very uplifting, because it's also the idea that at our core, we're not so bad after all, and that there is some hope for the human race. And where does dehumanization come from? Where does it actually come from? Where does it come from? The leaders. The leaders. There's a great quote from George Orwell. George Orwell said, one of the most horrible features of war, one of the most horrible features of war is that all the hatred, all the lies, all the propaganda always comes from people who aren't fighting. Politicians, media. Now, I'm not saying people can't become violent, but people can certainly become violent. And sometimes I think peace activists underestimate how violent people can really become. People can become so violent through the right conditioning, through the right abuse, that there's nothing you can do to stop them other than subduing them physically. I mean, one reason I got into this whole peace thing was my father, he was in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and he was very violent when I was a child, and I have a very violent temper. Uh, my temper is very, very violent. And the reason I got into this whole peace thing was trying to control my own violent urges. But I wasn't born that way. I was conditioned to be violent. Look at the violent criminal population. The vast majority of people in the violent criminal population were abused growing up. You look at the violent criminal population, overwhelming evidence that childhood neglect, childhood abuse makes people violent. So people aren't born violent, but people can become violent through the right conditioning, through the right abuse, through the right kind of trauma. So many people ask me as a soldier, how did I become interested in peace? As a young child, I had witnessed how war traumatized my father, and growing up living with him is very frightening through this violent behavior. So when I was very young, I began thinking of the problem of war and why war has to end. But then many people asked me if I wanted war to end, why did I join the army? Well, I think I joined the war, I think I joined the army for the same reason many people join the army. Because in our culture, we're taught that we need war to end war, and we need violence to stop violence. Right? Think about Spider-Man, Superman, and Batman. How do they protect the world? They punch people in the face, right? In the action movies I saw as a child, the hero would kill the bad guy, save the world, kiss the girl, and all be well. So we're taught in our culture that you need war to stop war, you need violence to stop violence. So a lot of people join the army thinking that they're going to make the world peaceful. You listen to President Obama or President Bush, they both say, we're fighting terrorism, we're spreading democracy, we're spreading freedom, we're making the world safer through military action. And the military appeals to that idealism and that kind of thinking. And if you look at World War II, when people were fighting Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, you had very high recruitment into, into the military. During the Vietnam War, when soldiers weren't sure why they were fighting, it was much more difficult to get people into the military. After September 11th, when we were attacked, an American politician said that we need to use military force to make the world safer and spread freedom and democracy around the globe. Again, recruitment went up. So when people believe they're fighting for a good cause and to make the world safer, it's much easier to get them into the military. Most soldiers want peace, but peace is the objective, not the means of arriving at that objective. So what happened in my life that caused me to see peace not just as the objective, but as a trans is the way of arriving at that objective? Well, during my time at West Point and in the Army, I learned several things that changed my life, and I'll share a few of those things today. The first thing I learned at West Point was that the nature of war is dramatically changing in a way that most people don't realize. The nature of war is dramatically different now than it was 50 or 100 or even 20 years ago. So technology forces war to evolve after the rifle was invented, swords are no longer used. After the machine gun was invented, people no longer fought lined up in rows. After the tank was invented and mass produced, the trenches from World War I went away. So what new technological innovation has forced war to evolve again? What new technological innovation has made war evolve more than the invention of the rifle, the machine gun, or the tank? Airplanes. Drones. Bombs. This is actually bigger than that. Computer. Computer. 
This is actually bigger than all of those things. Those are all important things. But it's actually mass media, something we use every day. Television, YouTube, Internet, right? Dramatically changed war in a way that we haven't really grasped yet. One thing I learned at West Point is that in the 21st century, wars are fought on CNN, Fox News, Al Jazeera, and the Internet as much as they're fought in the battlefield. And Admiral Mullen had a speech he gave recently where he said, the future of war is information. The whole future of war is information and perception. It's all about information and perception now. So, here's a story to illustrate that. I was watching 60 Minutes and a Marine colonel in Afghanistan said, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss. Why did that Marine colonel say if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss? Why did he say that? Right. Right. If you kill two civilians, you'll turn the population against you. What would happen if the Afghan or Canadian or British or Chinese army came to America and killed two civilians? How would the Americans react? We would go berserk. People don't like it when you come to their country and kill their people. Common sense, right? So what that Marine colonel in Afghanistan said is if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss. In other words, if less than 1% of the casualties you inflict are civilians, you will lose. But here's the problem. From World War II until today, the majority of people killed in war are civilians. And some conflicts of the 90% of the people killed are civilians. So do you see why it's so hard to win hearts and minds in war? If Abu Ghraib would have happened 500 years ago, would anybody know about it? Right? Nobody would know about it, or nobody would care. Look at the Roman Empire. If Martin Luther King Jr. would have been around in the Roman Empire, could he have done anything nonviolently against them? Right? There's no mass media, no television. So there's no film footage of people being attacked with fire hoses and police dogs. There's no reporters. There's no free press. There's no freedom of speech. So when you have this mass media, if you look at Gandhi, how he used international newspapers, right? Once you have mass media and you can disseminate information, things dramatically change. I mean, look, for example, the guy in Afghanistan who killed those 16 or 17 civilians. I mean, World War II, we would bomb a city, kill 100,000 civilians in a couple days. And it was a different time back then in terms of mass media and in terms of social norms. So here's an example to illustrate how much warfare has changed. Here's an example to illustrate that. What is more dangerous to the American government? What is more dangerous to the American government? 5,000 Taliban fighters or WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks is a lot more dangerous, right? Especially if you don't want your people to know what you're doing as a politician. So information is the weapon now. And distribu distribution of information and control of information. And public opinion. So how do you win hearts and minds? We weren't able to win hearts and minds in Vietnam. We aren't able to win hearts and minds now in the Middle East. How do you win hearts and minds? Well, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit the fact that people have hearts and minds, right? So you can't dehumanize them. And I think we have to look at the masters of winning hearts and minds. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Gandhi is more tactically and strategically brilliant than any general I've ever studied. Gandhi was more tactically and strategically brilliant than Alexander the Great, Hannibal, or Napoleon. And think about it. Gandhi was able to defeat the most powerful empire on earth, the British Empire, without firing a single bullet. Even more impressive, Gandhi was able to transform his enemy into a friend. I think if Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, would have been alive and able to witness Gandhi, I think he would have been in awe, because Gandhi thought tactically and strategically. And Sun Tzu said, Winning a hundred victories and a hundred battles is not the pinnacle of excellence. Defeating your opponent without bloodshed is the pinnacle of excellence. So another question. What does this term mean, waging peace? Gandhi waged peace rather than waged war. What does that mean to wage peace rather than to wage war? Exactly. And how do you change the status quo? Nonviolently, right? So, waging peace asserts that nonviolence is an action. It's not just being quiet, being in a room by yourself, being on the beach. It's an action. And what are examples of waging peace in history? Boycott. Pardon? Boycott. Boycott. What are other examples? Sit ins. Sit ins? Hunger strikes. Hunger strikes. What are examples in American history? Martin Luther King. 
demonstrations. Let's talk about how distorted our, the way we're taught American history is, how distorted our teaching of American history is, the way we're taught American history in schools. What did the Founding Fathers talk about? No taxation without representation. What does that mean? No taxation without representation. It means that you cannot tax people unless, you get, unless they have political participation. And in order to govern, you have to get the consent of the governed, right? And this is a very noble ideal, right? No taxation without representation. If you want to govern people, you have to get their consent. But, but prior to the 1820s and 1850s, 50 years after the Revolutionary War, less than 10% of the American population could vote in national elections. Women couldn't vote. African Americans couldn't vote. Native Americans couldn't vote. White people couldn't vote unless they owned land in most places. So 200 years ago in America, women couldn't vote or own property. How did women get the right to vote and own property? Did they fight a war? Demonstrations, Demonstrations right? How did the non-landowners get the right to vote? Right? Through non-violent methods. How did we get workers' rights? How did we get child labor laws? And even though the Civil War kept the Union together, it took a peaceful movement before African Americans truly got their human rights. It took a peaceful movement before they truly got their human rights. And how many European countries had a war to free the slaves? Zero. Not a single European country had a war to free the slaves. So if any of you ever read Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King Jr., the very startling thing about Frederick Douglass, especially about Frederick Douglass, is how patriotic they were. Very patriotic. They said, look at how amazing American ideals are. Look at how amazing our ideals are. And our concern is that we not, are not living up to our own ideals. If all you knew about the U.S. was what's on the Declaration of Independence, could you ever imagine the country that wrote that document ever supporting slavery? Couldn't even imagine that. So what Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr. said is our ideals are amazing, and we have to live up to our own ideals. And we